Good evening. Good evening. How are you? Good. 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 All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. And All we'll right. Go. All right. Here we go. Ready? Lady, empty, during, aren't, several, allow, eyebrow, strange, coffee, road, through, wide, bus, forget, gotten, smell, fear, press, Boyfriend, blonde, throw, round, sun, tall, glad, age, right, upon, hide, became, crowd, rain, save, trouble, annoy, weird, death, beat, trip, six, control, gonna, consider, nearly, join, learn, above, High, obviously, entire, direction, foot, angry, power, strong, quick, doctor, edge, song, asleep, 20, barely. All right, common phrases, here we go. This cannot, this could, this is, this shall, this should, this was, this were, this will, this would, through the, Thousand dollar, thousand dollars at a time, at all times, at that particular time, at that time, at the present time, at the same time, at the time, at this particular time, at this time, from time to time, good many times, great many times, to be. They recalled, they recollect, they recollected, they shall, they should, they understand, they understood, they want, they wanted. They were, they will, they would. Do you think? I can't think. I didn't think. I don't think. We think. What he thinks. What I think. What you think. Whether he thinks. Who thinks. Who think. You think. This be. This can. All right. Let's do some medical words. Here we go. Juncture point, descending ramus, expanding portion, rounded protuberance, straightening limbs, center line, patellar tendon, impacted fracture, inflammatory disease, ironization chamber, remaining constant, commonly applied, healing process, measurement, instrument, prescribed exercises, operative reduction, under anesthesia, diminishing qualities. All right. Now I've got some consonant compounds in sentences. One second. And this is going to emphasize initial TR. Here we go. There was a trace of truth in the story. A tracer tracked the trajectory. The doctor tried a tracheotomy. Try the trotting track for long shots. We traded two tracks of land. Even the tractor could get no traction. Our trademark was tried and true. By tradition, we save the trees. He tried to traduce my reputation. The traffic caused the tragedy. That trail led to a tragic, tragic tryst. Trailers were sold in the transaction. A tramp trampled the trampoline. She was in a tranquil trance. A tramway is a form of transportation. They tried to transcribe the trial notes. Transcribers trip on tr trilogies, transfer to the transatlantic flight. We had a tray, full, a tray full of treats. It is treacherous to tread on water. OK. 
Okay. Now these are going to be tangle tamers, but they're just regular tangle tamers. They're not, there's nothing with medical in them. Okay, here we go. Legitimate traditions, presumptuous interference, nuclear containment, structural changes, trade barrier, legitimate, agreed, customer initially, post-war industrial world, 100 megabyte hard disk, popular alternative, valued prudence, automotive ecstasy, micro channel bus architecture, seldom publicized, goal students, very possibly, senior senator, defense budget, manpower costs, uniformed personnel, emotional fires, scrawny and emaciated, phony bomb threats, resolve economic issues, film production headquarters, behind police barricades, battle against directors, aquamarine swimming pool, senior vice president, community reacted, adulterated cosmetics, as soon as practical, legislators balk, colorful eulogy, circuits overloaded, state disability, surrounding localities, soothing waters, um, salute defective, generous leadership, pitching prospects, cherished myths, proposed bylaws, dolphin safe tuna, continental branches, merger specialists, comprehensive brochures. Now we started this the other day. They're all words that start with EX, but we did not finish them. So we're gonna fin finish them today, okay? Here we go. Exhort, exorcism, ex-biology, expanded, exorbitant, expansion, ex parte, expend, expel, expert, expensive, exemplarize, expansive, expectant, extraneous, exotic, experience, expect, expendable, experiment, explain, expedient, explicit, expound, expedite, explanation, expose, expiate, explore, exponent, explode, expenditure, exploit, expedition, expire, expunge, expropriate, external, extinction, extreme, extension, extinct, exuberant, exude, extravagant, extract, extra, extent, external. Some of those are tongue twisters. I'm just dating this real quick. So I know we covered it. All right. Now I've got a drill here that focuses on final ST endings, which we use the um, FT for ST. All right, so I'm gonna give you the words and then I'll give you your sentences. Okay, here we go. Guess guest, host, hose, lost, loss, chase, chased, pace, paced, miss, missed, pose, post, base, based, ease, 
east, lease, least, trust, trust, pass, past. And here are your sentences. She lost her wallet. What was the loss? We lost the case. Paste the exhibit. She paced the floor. Use a light paste. He did his best. Have you seen Bess? It's the best way. Wipe off the mist. I missed you today. It is misting now. Please be our guest. Use the guest room. It's just a guess. Nail between the joists. The attorney lost the case. There will be frost tonight. She is your host. I am wearing hose. Thank your host. Baste the turkey. Use the base rate. It needs basting. They lost a great amount. Paul took a real pasting. Let's stay at a guest ranch. Do you trust them? He wears a truss. In God we trust. Don't waste so much time. You can't bring up the past. I am the last witness today. Take a blood pressure test. It is the least you can do. Please don't drive so fast. It was last night. Turn to the west. Don't act in haste. He's driving east. She works with ease. It's to the east. Wait until the pace dries. His horse ran in last place. It has a really bitter taste. All right. Now we started these earlier and I'm going to finish them. It's legal doublets, okay? Here we go. Bench warrant, reviewing court, holographic will, operative date, common carrier, Absentee voter, existing statutes, wrongful death, moral turpitude, non-cupative will, judge advocate, parole evidence, pre, pre or excuse me, let me, say, let me say that again, prejudicial error, conditional sale, quit claim deed, artificial person, amicable action. Collateral issue, mechanics lien, judgment debtor, eminent domain, legislative intent, frivolous actions, probable validity, enabling clause, prevailing party, local jurisdiction, closing arguments, governing rules. All right. Now here are some phrases that we hear. Um, they're just like short phrases. Some are short sentences. Some are complete sentences and some are not. Okay, here we go. My own father in the country, you might be right. It seemed too good. Read every story below the water next time. Will it last? It's hard to open, for example, Keep it up in the beginning, light the fire, the light in your eyes, a group of friends. We got together under the earth. We saw the food, both the children. It's my life, the big city. We started the fire, read the paper, run for miles. A good thought, do it often. Is it really true? It's time to eat. Until the end, a second later, near the sea, talk to my father, read your book, sing your song, the long list, my family, I miss you, a very important person, above the clouds, watch the game, I took the car, my feet hurt, I like being on the team, next to me, the dark night, a few children, it began to grow, Watch the river, a group of people, he started to cry. Too soon, leave it to me, an important idea. The first day of school, 
almost enough. All right, now we're going to finish the various descriptions using numbers and initials. A lot of these are motorcycles, but not all. All right, here we go. New Tour Guide Ultra GL 1500 SE, 4.3 liter Vortec engine, the Sporty CBX 150 and the NX 150, 16 valve DOHC power plant, retail price from $164.95 to $185.98. Tack steady at 12,000 RPMs. Performance shocks at $345.95 per pair. 32 to 45 miles per gallon and 39.1 miles per gallon average. 488 to 512 pound capacity. 5.53 by 73.8 inch cast aluminum 2015 sprint fc priced at thirty one thousand one hundred ninety eight dollars forty six cents 500 cc grand prix point standings finished 13th on a new r100 rt 2018 silver gray cbr 1000 f honda 29.7 feet by 63.9 feet by 7.1 feet. Bank balance reached $569.72. Central LCD display, 63 easy to use gizmos. All right. Now, this is a similar drill from what we had earlier. Um, it's common statements made by attorneys. So you're going to hear just examine, examination, uh, incompetent, which is IP, immaterial, IMT, telephone, uh, TEFL, instrument, STRUMT, under the circumstances, UTS, under all the circumstances, A-U-L-T-S, uh, previous, prev, court reporter, K-R-O-R-P, um, indict, is dight, indictment, D-I-M-T, D-long I-M-T. All right, so let me date this. All right, here we go. You must examine all of the evidence carefully before you decide. Please examine Exhibit D, then examine Exhibit H. The doctor had to examine the patient before rendering his medical opinion. The examination of the documents took several hours. His attorney recommended a medical examination. Upon close examination, the diamond was proven to be a fake. She said he was incompetent and not able to make a decision. I cannot believe how incompetent you can be. The incompetency of the witness was evident. The subject is immaterial. Objection, Your Honor, immaterial. Whether or not he goes with us is immaterial. The telephone rang several times before the officer or police officer picked it up. Did you talk to him in person or by telephone? The telephone call came at a very bad time. Which instrument was used to repair the hole in the suspect's leg? A doctor uses many instruments during surgery. My musical instrument of choice is a piano. Under the circumstances, I don't think I will arrive to the party on time. Well, under the circumstances, it is apparent that he is lying. Under the circumstances, I feel you have done a good job. I'm sure you did your best under all these circumstances. It is a miracle they found the murder weapon under all the circumstances. Under all the circumstances, he really blew it. When was the previous report given? At his previous job, he earned less money. 
What was your previous address? The court reporter is the lady seated to your left. The court reporter will prepare a written transcript of the proceedings. What time is the court reporter due to arrive at the deposition? When do you think they will indict him? The man was indicted for murder of another man. I know they will indict him after they hear all the testimony. The indictment came suddenly. What was the indictment for? The murder indictment was a sure thing. going to do one last drill and move on to literary, okay? This is the NT contraction drill. All right, here we go. He doesn't expect to win. It isn't good to postpone it. We haven't got it. We aren't in agreement. He didn't learn to operate it. He won't testify. Dogs won't be allowed in. It doesn't make a difference. Don't mention it. You can't miss the sign. Ted hadn't bought the lot. I shouldn't forget the date. Doesn't the car run well? I don't like to watch that. He didn't buy the book. The order is inaccurate. He didn't want to exercise. She wasn't in the house. I won't agree to call you. We aren't ready to comply. It isn't related to your work. Anne hasn't read the letter. We couldn't see a movie. Bob wouldn't relieve her. Won't you read the sign? Wayne can't admit to it. The men wouldn't quit. Wasn't there a copy for you? Didn't we pay that bill? I didn't see it happen. We don't risk much on it. Jake hadn't sneaked out. The car hasn't been fixed. Steve hadn't seen the point. The owner wouldn't agree. He won't take the bus. Hasn't the witness arrived? He can't seem to fix it. Mia can't help you. The doctors weren't with her. Don't forget the alternatives. They aren't here yet. Didn't the women own the stock? It wasn't anything to speak of. The court isn't open. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Our literary. We're gonna start off with um, some jury instructions, okay? I'm going to start at 180, but I will work my way to uh, 225. Okay. All right. Here we go. All right. Before the trial begins, there are certain instructions you should better have to understand your functions as a juror and how you should conduct yourself during the trial. Your duty is to decide the case based only on the evidence presented and the law given to you by the court. Do not let any personal feelings of bias or prejudice against any such things as race, religion, national origin, sex, or age affect your deliberations. Do not begin your deliberations and discussion of the case until all of the evidence is presented and I have instructed you on the law. Do not discuss this case among yourselves or with anyone else until your final deliberations in the jury room. We will stop or recess from time to time during the trial. You may be excused from the courtroom when it is necessary for me to hear legal arguments from the lawyers. If you come in contact with the parties, lawyers or witnesses, do not speak with them. For their part, the parties, lawyers, and witnesses will not contact or speak with the jurors. Should you be exposed to any reports or communications from any source concerning the case during the trial, 
you should report that information to the jury bailiff. The court is aware that many of you have, have been exposed to publicity concerning this case before you were selected to serve as a juror. Each of you has committed to base your verdict only on the evidence introduced during the trial. It is of vital importance to the parties and the sanctity of the court process that you remain true to this commitment. Anything you may see or hear outside the courtroom is not evidence. You are to decide the case solely on the evidence offered and received at trial. Evidence is first the sworn testimony of witnesses, both on direct and cross-examination, regardless of who called the witness. Second, the exhibits the court has received and third, any facts to which the lawyers have agreed or stipulated or which the court has directed you to find. Attorneys for each side have the right and the duty to object to what they consider are improper questions asked of witnesses and to the admission of other evidence which they believe is not properly admissible. You should not draw any conclusions from the fact that an objection has been made. By allowing testimony on other evidence to be received over the objection of counsel, the court is not indicating any opinion about the evidence. You jurors are the judges of the credibility of the witnesses and the weight of the evidence. You are not required to, but you may take notes during the trial, except during the opening statements and closing arguments. The court will provide you with the materials. In taking notes, you must be careful that it does not distract you from carefully listening to and observing the witnesses. You may rely on your notes to refresh your memory during deliberations, otherwise keep them confidential. Your notes will be collected by the jury bailiff after each day's session and keep in a secure place until the next day of trial. After the trial, the notes will be collected and destroyed. You will not have a copy of the written transcript of the trial testimony available for use during your deliberations. You may ask to have specific portions of the testimony read to you. You should pay careful attention to all of the testimony because you must rely primarily on your memory of the evidence and testimony introduced during the trial. To assist you in reevaluating the evidence, I will now read to you the portions of the specific jury instructions for the offenses with which the defendant is charged. I will read them to you in their entirety at the close of the evidence. Count one. Count one of the information charges the defendant with first degree intentional homicide as a party to a crime to the crime. Section 939.05 of the Wisconsin Criminal Code provide that whoever is concerned in the commission of a crime is a party to that crime and may be convinced of that crime although that person did not directly commit it. The state contends that the defendant was concerned in the commission of the crime of first degree intentional homicide by either directly committing it or by intentionally aiding and abetting the person who directly committed it. If a person intentionally aids and abets the commission of a crime, then that person is guilty of the crime as well as the other person who directly committed it. A person intentionally aids and abets the commission of a crime when acting with knowledge or belief that another person is committing or intends to commit a crime, he knowingly either assists the person who commits the crime or is ready and willing to assist, and the person who commits the crime knows of the willingness to assist. To intentionally aid and abet the crime of first degree intentional homicide, the defendant must know that another person is committing or intends to commit the crime of first degree intentional homicide and have the person and have the purpose to assist the commission of that crime. Before you may find that the defendant is guilty of first degree intentional homicide as a party to the crime, the state must prove by the evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant directly committed the crime of first degree intentional homicide or intentionally aided and abetted the commission of the crime. All 12 jurors do not have to agree on whether the defendant directly committed the crime of first degree intentional homicide or aided and abetted the commission of the crime. However, each juror must be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant was concerned in the commission of the crime in one of those ways. First degree intentional homicide as defined in 940.01 of the Criminal Code of Wisconsin is committed by one who causes the death of another human being with the intent to kill that person or another. 
before you may find the person, the defendant guilty of first degree intentional homicide, the state must prove by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the following two elements were present. Number one, Brian Dorsey caused the death of Tracy Hall or aided and abetted another in causing the death of Tracy Hall. Cause means that the defendant's acts were a substantial factor in producing the death. Number two, Brian Dorsey acted with the intent to kill Tracy Hall, whether he did so directly or aided and abetted another. Intent to kill means that the defendant had the mental pro process or purpose to take the life of another human being or was aware that his conduct was practically certain to cause the death of another human being. While the law requires that the defendant acted with intent to kill, it does not require that the intent exists for any particular length of time before the act is committed. The act need not be brooded over, considered or reflected upon for a week, a day, an hour, or even a minute. There need not be any unappreciable time between the formation of the intent and the act. The intent to kill may be formed at any time before the act, including the instant before the act, and must continue to exist at the time of the act. You cannot look into a person's mind to find the intent. Intent to kill must be found, if found at all, from the defendant's acts, words, and statements, if any, and from all of the facts and circumstances in this case bearing upon the intent. Intent should not be confused with motive. While proof of intent is necessary to a conviction, proof of motive is not. Motive refers to a person's reason for doing something. While motive may be shown as a circumstance to aid in the establishing the guilt of a defendant, the state is not required to prove motive on the part of the defendant in order to convict. Evidence of motive does not by itself establish guilt. You should give it the weight you believe it deserves under all of these circumstances. You are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt at the conclusion of the trial that the defendant directly committed both elements of the first degree intentional homicide or that the defendant intentionally aided and abetted the commission of the crime. You should find the defendant guilty. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty. Charge two charges that the defendant, or excuse me, count two charges that the defendant with mutilating a corpse also as a party to the crime. Section 939.05 of the Criminal Code of Wisconsin provides that whoever is concerned in the commission of a crime is a party to that crime and may be convicted of that crime, although that person did not directly commit it. The state contends that the defendant was concerned in the commission of the crime of mutilating a corpse by either directly committing it or by intentionally aiding and abetting the person who directly committed it. If a person intentionally aids and abets the commission of a crime, then that person is guilty of the crime as well as the person who directly committed it. Person intentionally aids and abets the commission of a crime when acting with knowledge or belief that another person is committing or intends to commit a crime. He either increasingly assists the person who commits the crime or is ready and willing to assist, and the person who commits the crime knows of the willingness to assist. To intentionally aid and abet the crime of mutilating a corpse, the defendant must know that another person is committing or intends to commit the crime of mutilating a corpse and have the purpose to assist the commission of that crime. So um, I know we've already started this and it's just a continuation. It's really long. So I, you know, if you've already, if you're going, wait a minute, I've heard this. It's the continuation. Okay. Long, long case. All right. How are we doing on time? Oh, good. We're doing good. All right. So I'm going to give you um, just a little bit of a jury charge. Okay. Um, I got up to 225 with that one. So I'll start this one at 200 and work my way to 225, okay? Uh, the subject is responsibility of railroads. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, every engineer driving an engine on any railway is required to sound the whistle at least 80 rods from any crossing with a road or a street on the same level and to continue the sounding of such whistle at intervals until the train shall have completely crossed such road. The fact that the train was not running on scheduled time is of no sequence or consequence, and no claim of negligence in that respect is claimed by the plaintiff. The same is true as to the crossing signs 
at the intersection. The driver of the car, Paul Hopkins, was familiar with the crossing and knew that the trains ran daily over this crossing. I think it must be conceded that the plaintiff was negligent as a matter of law. Where a train is proceeding at a reasonable rate of speed, it has the right of way over automobiles approaching and crossing such track. And the engineer on a train has the right to assume until the contrary becomes apparent that an automobile approaching the crossing will yield to the approaching train. With regard to speed of trains at crossings, ordinarily the question is one of fact for the jury. A high rate of speed may be perfectly proper at country crossings, but it depends usually upon the circumstances of each particular case. Where a crossing is usually or unusually dangerous because of an obstructed view, a curve in the track, or other peculiar situation or conditions, then a greater precaution is required than would be required at an ordinary crossing where the view is open and unobstructed. You jurors have seen this crossing and therefore you will better understand the testimony given you in court with respect to the nature of the crossing and whether or not greater precaution was required than at the ordinary open country crossing and whether or not the speed of the train at the time of this accident was reasonable under the circumstances. It was the duty of the engineer to sound the whistle for the crossing and also to operate the train at a reasonable speed under the circumstances. Failure to do that would constitute negligence on the part of the defendant. If the jury finds that the engineer did sound the whistle for the crossing, then the jury will find that the defendant, Smith Railway Company, was not negligent and bring in a verdict for the defendant of no cause of action. On the other hand, if the engineer did not sound the whistle as required by law for the crossing here in question, or did not operate the train at a reasonable speed, then you will take up and consider whether or not such negligence on the part of the defendant was a proximate cause of the accident. If you find from the evidence that the defendant, Smith Railway Company, was negligent in the manner claimed by the plaintiff, and you further find that such negligence was a proximate cause of the accident, then it becomes your duty to bring in a verdict in favor of the plaintiff, even though you find that the accident was caused by the combined negligence of the engineer and the driver of the car, Paul Hopkins. The negligence of the driver of the car does not relieve the Smith Railway Company from liability if the negligence of the engineer contributed to proximately cause the accident. If the accident was caused by the sole negligence of Mr. Hopkins in the operation of the car, then there is no liability on the part of the defendant, Smith Railway Company. But if the accident was caused by the combined negligence of the driver of the car and the negligence of the engineer on the train in failing to sound the whistle for the crossing or in failing to operate the train at a reasonable speed, and the negligence of each was a substantial factor in proximately causing the accident, then you will find a verdict in favor of the plaintiff and against the defendant. The burden of proof rests upon the plaintiff to prove by the preponderance of the evidence that the defendant Smith Railway Company was negligent as claimed by the plaintiff and that its negligence was a substantial factor in proximately contributing to cause the accident. If on this question you find from the evidence that the defendant was negligent, as claimed by the plaintiff and that the negligence of the defendant substantially contributed to proximately caused the accident, then you will find a verdict for the plaintiff for all of the injuries and damages sustained by him. But if on this question of defendant's negligence, you find that the evidence evenly balanced or preponderating in defendant's favor, then the plaintiff cannot recover. If you so find, then your verdict will be in favor of the defendant, no cause of action. To briefly sum up the issues, if the accident was caused by the combined negligence of the driver of the car and the Smith Railway Company, then your verdict will be for the plaintiff and against the defendant for the full amount of the damages sustained. But if you find that the defendant was not negligent and that the accident was caused by the sole negligence of the driver of the car, then your verdict will be for the defendant, no cause of action. If you find that the plaintiff is entitled to recover, then the last question for you to decide is the question of damages. And I did, I read about half of that at 225. Okay. Let's start some Q&A. All right. Just 
update this. This is going to start with defense. Okay. But uh, plaintiff and the court both come in. Okay. All right. So I'm going to start at 180. And let's see how long this is. I'll probably just get to 200 with this one. And then the next one, we'll start at 200 and work our way to 225. Here we go. Mrs. Miller, do you recall anything from the recording that was played in this courtroom when you asked several times whether or not your husband was dead or injured? Yes, ma'am, I do. And in response to one of Mr. Phillips' questions, you indicated that that was the first time that you found out that your husband was seriously injured. Is that right? Yes, ma'am, it is to my knowledge. Do you recall having a conversation with a Brent Knox in the Boise City Jail? Vaguely, yes, ma'am. Do you recall the date of that conversation? Well, I think it was sometime in November. Do you recall the substance of that conversation with Mr. Knox? Most of it, yes. Do you recall saying, well, they tried to kill Tony. They told me they wouldn't hurt him? Vaguely, yes. I guess I said something along those lines. So you were aware that Tony was seriously injured when you left the house? No. Why did you make that statement to Mr. Knox? Your Honor, I will object to that question as argumentative. Overruled. Your Honor, I will rephrase it. Mrs. Miller, on that date after you were taken into custody in the jail, you told Brent Knox that you knew that your husband was either dead or seriously injured. Do you recall making that statement? Yes, ma'am, kind of. You have testified in court today that you did not know whether your husband was dead or seriously injured until later that day when you were interrogated by Deputy Perez. That's when I officially knew his status. That's when you officially knew what, Mrs. Miller? That my husband was still alive. Actually, isn't it true that before you were removed from the house that night, they told you that your husband was seriously injured? I don't remember. Yes or no? I, I don't know. Later at the time when you were interrogated, which we have on the recordings, you asked if your husband was alive, is that correct? I think I did. At that time, you made some statements saying, thank heavens, thank the Lord. Yes, that is true. What made you believe Deputy Perez at that time and not earlier at your place of residence? Well, because someone came in the room, one of the other officers, and he said that he had received a call from the hospital that my husband was in intensive care. Mrs. Miller, do you recall sitting in a squad car that evening? Yes, ma'am, I do. And do you recall hearing a statement over the radio of the squad car that there was a shotgun victim at 908 Skyview Lane? Well, now, how do you expect me to remember all of this? Objection, Your Honor. It is assuming a fact not yet in evidence. Sustained. Your Honor, I am asking if she recalls the statement on the radio. She can answer yes or no. The witness is instructed to answer the question. No, ma'am. Do you recall Deputy Perez sitting in the patrol car with you? I don't really remember what his name was. Was that man in the squad car with you in uniform? No, ma'am, he was not. Was he in civilian clothes? Yes, ma'am. Do you recall Deputy Perez telling you that you were under arrest for murder? No, I don't remember that. Your Honor, this assumes a fact that is not yet in evidence. Your Honor, it calls for a yes or no answer. Proceed, Mrs. Delaney. Mrs. Miller, do you recall being told by Deputy Perez at your residence after the shooting that you were under arrest? No, ma'am, I wasn't told I was under arrest. You don't recall being told that you were under arrest? No, ma'am, I don't recall that. Mrs. Miller, isn't it your testimony that at that time you broke down and began intermittently crying and screaming at Deputy Perez? What would you do? I was upset. There were policemen all over the place. My hands were handcuffed behind my back. I was forced to lie down on the back seat of the squad car. I was crying. I don't recall making any statements. I did not believe that the gun had discharged. You indicated in response to some questions presented by Mr. Phillips that you and Brent Knox left the house and went for a drive on the Sunday in question. Yes, ma'am. Could that have been a Saturday? No, ma'am. It was a Sunday. Are you positive it was a Sunday? Yes, I am positive. Do you recall having a conversation with Brent Knox regarding some stocks and securities? that your husband, Tony, planned to transfer to your name? I recall no such conversation with Brent. You never made that statement? 
That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. All right. Let's switch transcripts. Again, this is going to, looks like defense, but plaintiff in the court will come in, okay? Now I'm gonna start 200, work my way to 225. Here we go. Mr. Evans, did you at any time tell the investigating officer at the scene that somebody in a red VW came up and told you that they had witnessed the accident also? That was on the police report, but I didn't remember the red VW until I came here and saw it again on the report. Did you at the time of making, how did you make a report to the police officer of the New Mexico Highway Patrol? I, I don't know. And at the time you made the report, did you tell him that somebody in a red VW came up and told you that they had witnessed the accident? I think he said he witnessed it through his rear view mirror, if that means anything. That what? If that means anything. Excuse me, Mr. Evans, the question is whether you made such a statement to the police officer. Okay, I did. If it is on there, I will go along with what I said then. I guess I did. All right. Did you also tell the officer that you didn't know in which direction the red VW was headed, that you thought it was going north on Alameda? I don't remember what I told him. What does it say on the report? May we hand the witness defendants exhibit A? Yes, go ahead. Would you look at it? The third page of the police report where it says witness number one. Yes, I'm looking at it. Now, does it say there that the witness Evans also stated that a man in a red VW stopped and told Evans that he had gone through the intersection and then observed that the traffic collision in the rear view mirror was observed by him and that vehicle number two had passed through a red light? That is what it said. Did you make that statement to the investigating officer? I don't remember saying it. I don't remember much about it. I guess I said it. I don't think I lied. You can ask him if I said it. And on page four, it says, witness Evans stated he does not know in what direction the red VW was traveling, but believes it was northbound on Alameda. Did you make that statement to the officer? I don't remember. Now getting back to the question put to you earlier about another report made, to the investigating officer of the Santa Fe Insurance Company. Do you recall at all making any report to the agent purporting to be someone representing the Santa Fe Insurance Company? I don't remember the guy, I really don't. Do you consider yourself as having a pretty good memory? Well, I made it this far, you know. I remember things that I have to take care of myself. Other people's problems, I don't think that much about. Mr. Evans, you testified earlier that the you looked up at the traffic light on the northwest corner of La Sierra and Alameda, and that as you looked up, the light indicated red for the westbound traffic, is that correct? I testified earlier, earlier when? Just a few moments ago. I can't remember saying which light it was. I think it was the northwest. Mr. Evans, please collect your thoughts. Your testimony is important here today, okay? Okay, so you are not certain. I'm not certain. Are you certain as to what color the light was when you looked up? I'm certain the light was red when I looked at it, yes. Now, why are you so certain or what makes you so sure that the light was red? What do you rely on to base your answer that the light was red? My eyes, could it have been green? Wait a minute, as you stated, counsel, I object to the question as argumentative. It is ambiguous, it is uncertain. It could have been any color. He already testified as to what he observed. Objection is sustained. Let me rephrase the question. Is there any doubt in your mind whatsoever concerning the color of the light when you looked up at it? No. Now, will you tell me all of the facts on which you rely indicating that the light was in fact red? The facts which I rely on? My pants are black and my socks are green. Mr. Evans, let me put it this way. You don't recall exactly which corner the light was on? Was that your testimony? Which corner the signal was on that you observed? Well, I will tell you what I recall about the signal, somewhere between the overhead thing over the gas station, the awning over the pumps of the gas station. When I looked up, I managed to see what I think is the light that stands over, way over the center of the street. It hangs off an arch that is attached to a pole that sits at the northwest corner. I am pretty sure that is what the light is that I saw. All right, so let's switch transcripts again. I'm just gonna date this. He sounds like a spunky 
elderly man, if I had to guess. <laughs> All right. Again, um, I'm going to just continue at 225, okay? All right. And defense is questioning. There we go. So that Jeep was more than just a casual part of the investigation, wasn't it? It was, it was, it was important up to a point, yes. I believe your statement was to the effect that it would have taken a lot of hours to do the follow-up to locate that Jeep. When you are conducting an investigation of a crime scene, I believe you talked about the crime scenes earlier, you went through how significant the crime scene was. Wouldn't you spend the hours to A, try to locate a crime scene, and B, try to preserve it, and C, try to get as much evidence from the crime scene as possible? Yes, that would be the perfect setting, yes. And I believe you said that the crime scene was probably one of the most significant parts of the investigation of a homicide. Is that correct? I don't know if I use the word significant. I think a lot of things are important, including, including the crime scene, yes. Well, the crime scene is most frequently where you are going to find physical evidence concerning the crime, isn't it? That's true. In your training to be an investigator in the homicide division, do they put down a set number of hours that you are allowed to devote to, say the crime scene and the set number of hours that you devote to other aspects of the crime? No, usually there's other things that regulate your time, other crimes that you might be investigating, that sort of thing, four or five other homicides that you are working at at the same time. Okay, now this crime occurred in 2012. There came a point in time where you knew that this case would be going to trial. Did you then at least take up more evidence or gather up more evidence to help you to try to find that Jeep or go to Retha Thomas and give her the description of the Jeep that you had and see if she could be more specific about it or anything like that? Well, three years later, I didn't do anything after that, no. Well, you didn't arrest Mr. Myers until approximately a year after this, this killing, these killings. During that whole year until you arrested him, did you take the information that you had and go out and try to verify it or anything like that? No, you indicated to us that you found a bullet in the portion of the crime scene where the bodies were located and you described it as a, quote, fresh bullet. Tell me the characteristics of the fresh bullet. Well, it's not going to be weather beaten. It's not going to have any rust. It's not going to have dust, debris, dirt on it. It's not going to be discolored. This bullet that was found out there on the sand, that chunk of lead, what is your experience as to how long it takes for the rest to form on the lead? I don't know. So when you say that you believe that the bullet came from Yolanda's body, you're basing that upon the fact that there is a body out there in the desert that you find this bullet in the proximity of the body, that there are there is some blood out there in the desert. Is that correct? Yes and there are two bodies out there, the blood in the sand, and we talked about this. Did you match the blood in the sand up to either of the two bodies found there in the desert? I didn't do that, no. If I keep asking you about finding body tissue, blood, that sort of thing on the bullet that was found out there, and you said that you didn't find any, did you? Did you determine the caliber of the bullet? Yeah, at a later time, what Norm Wallace testified to, yes. When was it that you determined what the caliber of the bullet was? Well, from the onset, I thought it was a 38 or a nine millimeter in that range. Norm Wallace confirmed that it was larger than a 38. It could be a 38, it could be a nine millimeter, but there is a problem with the 38. Could it be a 357? Correct. So you never really determined the exact caliber of the bullet, did you? It's a nine millimeter as far as I'm concerned, but the experts looked and they never really determined the exact caliber of the bullet, did you? No, because the jacket was missing. The question was, it was never determined, was it? I'm not sure if, if Norm Wallace gave an opinion as to what it is. He did. He said it could have been a 9 millimeter, 357 or 38. Now, what is your training in ballistics, Detective Gonzalez? Very, very little. How many classes have you taken in comparison of bullets and determining the caliber of the bullets? One, is that part of your basic training as a sheriff's deputy? It may have been, I'm not. It's been some time ago. How many times have you sat down with an expert who's been trained and schooled in determining the calibers and taken a known caliber, an unknown caliber, and compared them and determined the caliber of a bullet, a fired bullet? A known caliber and unknown caliber? Yeah, I'm not sure if I can answer that the way you're asking the question. How many times have you been qualified to testify in court 
as an expert on the determination of the caliber of bullets, none. What is it now then about that particular bullet, that piece of lead that makes you determine that it is a nine millimeter? Well, because the lead bullet had no ridge marks on it. So therefore it had to have a jacket on it. The jacket must be separated and was never found. So that means it has to be a nine millimeter. It would be a nine millimeter had that jacket been found. Have you ever seen a 38 that separates it from its jacket? Not that I remember right now. How many 38s have you examined? Spent 38 bullets, maybe 15 or 20, and all of those had a jacket on them? I don't remember now. Those bullets you're talking about are taken from a body in an autopsy. I'm not talking about, I asked you how many bullets. Is that the qualification you wish to place on it? I'm sorry, is that the qualification that these bullets that you removed from a body Actually, the pathologist did, and then the hands, and then he hands them to us. I just asked how many 38 bullets you've examined without a jacket to determine the caliber. I don't remember without researching thousands and thousands of files. May I have just a moment, Your Honor? Certainly. Back on the record. Okay, so let's do some read back. All right. All right, so this is defense. I'm gonna read this first at 225, then at 200, and then at 180, okay? There we go. Did you have your glasses on at the time? I always had them on. Do you know when they came off? After he grabbed me, I know that, that is all I know. You didn't realize you had lost them until you got out or were on your way out? That is right. And at that time, Mr. Porter was outside with you? Yes, sir. Did you see how Mr. Porter got out there? He came out through the door. He was right there with me. Was he ahead of you or behind you? Well, that I don't know. He can tell you that. Well, did you see Mr. Porter start out with you when you left the table? No, I didn't. My head was on the floor. There is the place yet where I was dragged over the floor. On the right cheek there? Yes, that has never healed up yet. You mean he was dragging your feet first? No, he had me in his arm and was dragging me. In other words, he was pulling you just by that right wrist there? Yes, sir. I see, but you weren't walking at all? No. Your feet were dragging along? When he gave my arm a twist, it flipped me to the floor. He just twisted my right wrist hard. You said right. All right. Let's do this again at 200. If it sounds familiar, it's because we did this one page in uh, the mid speeds back in January, but we haven't done it in high speeds yet. So if you were there and it, this sounds familiar, that's why. All right, let's do it again at 200. Did you have your glasses on at the time? I always had them on. Do you know when they came off? After he grabbed me, I know that, that is all I know. You didn't realize you had lost them until you got out or were on your way out? That is right. And at that time, Mr. Porter was outside with you? Yes, sir. Did you see how Mr. Porter got out there? He came out through the door. He was right there with me. Was he ahead of you or behind you? Well, that I don't know. He can tell you that. Well, did you see Mr. Porter start out with you when you left the table? No, I didn't. My head was on the floor. There is the place yet where I was dragged over the floor. On the right cheek there? Yes, that has never healed up yet. You mean he was dragging you feet first? No, he had me in his arm and was dragging me. In other words, he was pulling you just by that right wrist there? Yes, sir. I see, but you weren't walking at all? No, your feet were dragging along? When he gave my arm a twist, it flipped me to the floor. He just twisted my wrist hard. All right, let's do it one last time at 180. Did you have your glasses on at the time? I always had them on. Do you know when they came off? After he grabbed me, I know that. That is all I know. You didn't realize you had lost them until you got out or were on your way out? That is right. And at that time, Mr. Porter was outside with you? Yes, sir. 
Did you see how Mr. Porter got out there? He came out through the door. He was right there with me. Was he ahead of you or behind you? Well, that I don't know. He can tell you that. Well, did you see Mr. Porter start out with you when you left the table? No, I didn't. My head was on the floor. There is the place yet where I was dragged over the floor. On the right cheek there? Yes, that has never healed up yet. You mean he was dragging you feet first? No, he had me in his arm and was dragging me. In other words, he was pulling you just by that right wrist there? Yes, sir. I see, but you weren't walking at all? No, your feet were dragging along? When he gave my arm a twist, it flipped me to the floor. He just twisted my wrist hard. All right. Just let me know when you find your spot. Okay. All right. Um, I'll go ahead and go first. Question, did you have your glasses on at the time? Answer, I always had them on. Question, do you know when they came off? Answer, after he grabbed me. I know that. That is all I know. Question, you didn't realize you had lost them until you got out or were on your way out? Answer, that is right. Question, and at that time, Mr. Porter was outside with you? Answer, yes, sir. Question, did you see how Mr. Porter got out there? Answer, he came out through the door. He was right there with me. Question, was he ahead of you or behind you? Answer, well, that I don't know. He can tell you that. Question, well, did you see Mr. Porter start out with you when you left the table? Answer, no, I didn't. My head was on the floor. There is the place yet where I was dragged over the floor. Question, on the right cheek there? Answer, yes, that has never healed up yet. Question, you mean he was dragging you feet first? Answer, no. He had me in his arm and was dragging me. Question, in other words, he was pulling you just by that right wrist there? Answer, yes, sir. Question, I see, but you weren't walking at all? Answer, no. Question, your... Um, I have your foot was dragging oh, or I have your foot were dragging. So I don't know what I meant. <laughs> yeah. So it should be feet. Okay. Your, your feet, feet were dragging along. Yep. That's it. Answer when he Nailed me. <laughs> That's okay. Do you have when he gave? <laughs> nailed me. <laughs> That's awesome. I don't he, have when he gave. I don't know why I have when he nailed me. <laughs> you do? Oh my goodness. What where, what was happening? <laughs> I don't think I said nailed. Oh. Okay, what I have when he nailed me to the Oh, maybe flipped. Okay, so this is what it is. When he gave my arm a twist, <laughs> it flipped me. Okay, I before. missed that whole beginning part. <laughs> he I went and then, okay, so it should be flipped. Me to yeah. the floor. I just twisted my wrist hard. Yeah, he. Good, good job. He. Yeah, he just twisted my wrist hard. That's okay, though. That's right. Like, that nailed is probably when flipped came in that makes yeah. sense <laughs> okay 
flipped. I'll need to oh my gosh. work on that. That was my that was my two twenty five takes. So that's good though. That's I, good. I hung on until that last question. That's I guess. right. That's <laughs> right. And that was the first take, so it wasn't like you had any, you know, yeah, any type of warm up. Cool. All right. Well, awesome job. Are you going to be able to make it on Friday morning? Yes, I will okay. be there. Good. Okay. All right. I'll I will be here. See. Yes. Be here. <laughs> be there. I'll, I'll see you then. All right. Have a great night. You too. Okay. Bye, Catherine. Right. Bye. Bye.